Do you want to say anything to start yes. out? No, we'll yes, go. just a quick word while everybody's eating, too. Um, so, uh, uh, I'm Vince LaFontaine, Executive Director at um, Flanders Nature Center and Land Trust. I so appreciate seeing everybody out here tonight. This is the first of um, two nights of um, land monitor training. Um, I do want to recognize the volunteer leaders um, who are here, who have put together the training tonight. I'm going to start with John Trainer, our chairman of our land management committee, and actually newly elected board member of Flanders Nature Center and Land Trust just last week. Thank you, John. Also, I want to recognize um, Dr. Priscilla Price, Tom Buckbooker, and Jennifer Jayner. I see them in the room for doing all of this organization and all of your, all year long, your hard work and dedication to the coordination of the different easement and fee property um, monitors. I should know this um, uh, number off the top of my head, but I don't. Can someone help me? How many people are involved in um, land monitoring? Um, roughly, what do we say? What was our invite list for this? It's like 40 ish? I think it's going to be a surprising number. 40? I think it's over 40. 40 to 50. As, as you can see, there, there are dozens of folks who are involved in this. And um, so many folks who have been um, dedicated to being land monitors for many years. And I'm also thankful to see new folks in the room tonight joining in on this. This is a volunteer effort, a very, very important part of Flanders' ongoing promise to our community when we take these properties into our care. So thank you very much for your um, personal contribution um, to Flanders Nature Center and Land Trust, but also to the ongoing health of our community. Okay. And maybe last word, I really enjoy going out onto the properties and if there's ever a time when you would like to take me onto one of the properties I haven't been on, because I have not been on all of our um, over 50 properties yet, and to help me from keep uh, keep me from getting lost, like um, Deb and Mike have done a few times on some of the properties, call me up or email me. Bring, uh, ask me to come along with you. Um, I really enjoy. If I'm able to put it into my um, schedule, I enjoy going out there and seeing these properties too. So. Thanks again. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate it. Okay, so um, while I'm setting up the presentation, if you have a presentation, we want to keep it casual. So we're looking for, you know, the objective of this is to get people oriented on what land monitoring is, sort of calibrate. Some folks have done it for many, many years. Some people are new. I'd like to hear your experiences about what's worked for you or any questions you have as we kind of just sort of be consistent about how we monitor the properties. So I do have a few slides to go through that will help orient it, and those slides are in front of you there as well, so you can take notes. Um, but trying to get, you know, obviously if you have questions or, or uh, experiences you'd like to share, or what's worked for you if you've been a monitor for a while, we'd like to hear that as well. A few topics for today. I'll just give a brief orientation of what, how we do land management just generally, for those that don't know, more of the inner workings of how, how we're structured there. You know, why do we monitor? What's the importance of monitoring? And then kind of the three steps. How do you prepare? What's some things you might want to do while you're out there on the walk? And then what's the follow-up for, for after you do the walk? And then we're going to try to institute some special concerns each year. Uh, you have a handout in front of you that talks about a special concern we have for hemlock trees that we'd like you to look for while you're out there um, this year. Uh, we'll get more into that later. And then, of course, Q&A. And if there's any questions as we go, please let me know. Some acknowledgements, um, as we kind of developed this training and kind of thought through best practices, we did seek out you know, what people are doing uh, outside of Flanders. You know, there's a lot of land trusts in Connecticut and how they do, and they do the same thing we do, basically. All, certif all um, certified land trusts. So we did get a lot of input from folks just to acknowledge um, those, those folks as well. So Priscilla, why don't you walk us through the vision sure that uh, connects here? I, I, these are pretty much self-explanatory. We put them up here purposely because we think that it's very important for all of us. We are land stewards in this room, but Flanders is much more than just the land stewards in this room. And we need everyone, or hope everyone will be aware, that Flanders' mission is indeed to protect our natural world, but we do it through stewarding, through camps, through educational programs for adults, through
through all sorts of different aspects of Flanders, and it would be nice if we all were aware of all those different aspects. The reason it says current is that those, the mission and the vision, are being rewritten right now. They're basically the same, except to put more emphasis on the inclusiveness of the other, all parts of Flanders, including art, and the inclusiveness of trying to make this available for all people. So quickly, I mean, this is the land management group. So if it does, maybe you know these stats, but 2,400 acres is a lot, right? So, and 40, 40 plus properties that have to be monitored and, and tracked and, and cared for, and across three different towns. Um, we are accredited by this uh, entity called the Land Trust Alliance, and that gives us, you know, street credibility as far as we are, we are stewarding our. our our uh, properties appropriately, um, and when we go for grant money or whatever, we can, we can stand on our on, on our feet with saying that you know we are credited through this alliance so that's monitoring us. Um, we have a land management committee which has about 10, 10 folks on it. We meet monthly, um, go through a lot of different topics about managing the trails and uh, some acquisition conversations, and, and, and again this monitoring um, thing. So. Um, Land acquisition has its own. Sharon Feely runs that, that to, to look at new properties in town. So if you have any friends that want to donate property, let us know. <laughs> Sharon will be more than happy to talk to them. That, they go right to the board and the violations. So if there's something that we find that's a violation, we, we have a separate group that deals with that very specifically because it needs to be handled appropriately. Uh, and they go up to the board. So if people are interested, if you're not, I know a lot of committee members are in the room, but if you're not involved and would like to be more involved, um, in, in being on the committee, just let me know. And, you know there's always room for, for more voices in that, in that forum. So, you know, a picture of our one of our picnics here uh, in the picnic second library we went to. Um, why monitor? So, I mentioned about being accredited. So, part of that accreditation is that we are looking after our properties and making sure that they are maintained as they're supposed to be maintained in the, in the land management plans or in the easement uh, documents and everything. So um, we, we do need to do that on an annual basis and document what we see, uh, correct any actions that need to be corrected. And you know, a lot, a lot of it is about leaving things in their natural state. Uh, and some of the easements, and, and Priscilla will get into this later, some of the easements have very specific things about what can and cannot be done on those properties. So we need to make sure that that's adhered to. Um, and you know why? Why I monitor? I mean, I joined in 2015. Um, I joined Flanders and started the Maple Syrup program, which a lot of people probably do. They had their Maple Syrup and they did end up doing other stuff. I ended up um, getting with Jeff and uh, Phil Maxwell at the time, and they needed help with monitoring. I, I frankly I just like walking in the woods, so uh, it gives me a chance. And I, I monitor the Janung property, and Janung, the Janung property is what 80 acres? I think it's 80 acres, and. It's private property, so it, I get on there once a year. It's a beautiful piece of property. I find that very advantageous for me to get out there to see a beautiful piece of property um, and then walk it. So you know, it's, it's that's why I connect connecting with the with the land is really important for me. Um, so in summary, we do these annual monitoring. We'll talk about what the monitoring is again: the preparation, going on the uh, walk, and then some of the activities afterwards. So documenting things, making photographs. Um, and if violations are found, you know, we have an obligation to elevate it, so. Um, we have two kinds of properties. This is a simple kind of, I think a lot of people know this, but uh, I didn't know when I came in, so just the ground people. Um, I didn't understand what they could, people could talk about fee property. Basically, a fee property means it's owned by Flanders. It's, it's, it's a property that is owned by Flanders um, on the books that they're in the deed. Um, and there's a land management plan. It, Van Black is a, obviously one of the biggest properties we have. There's a management plan for it about what it, what the uses are for this property and how it's managed. Um, and uh, easement is owned by somebody else. But there is a legal document which basically says, yes, part of our property, all of our property which we own, has a conservation value to it and we want, or we have, by vir virtue of buying the property, we've inherited a, a, an easement on that property to maintain it in a certain way, as, as outlined. Down. So that's a, those are the two properties. So some of you are fee monitors, some of you are easement monitors. There is a distinction which we'll get into, um, and some of you are both. So appreciate appreciate that. Any questions on just the difference between fee and easement, or 
Yeah. So Priscilla, we're going to get a little of these ones right away. So. Okay. Um, this is, again, pretty self-explanatory, and we're not going to read through the slides. We're just going to try and add to them. But I think one of the things that you have to understand about easements, if you're involved with easements, is that they are all different. We do not have one boilerplate. This is the way it works. This is the way an easement is set up. They've all been individually written up. They have different restrictions, different rights that people can use or not use. Um, within those easements, the ones that Flanders have, we have two basic types, the easy ones. That are the big ones where an owner decided that he or she wanted to have a part of their property, 50 acres, 100 acres, whatever, preserved in its natural state in perpetuity. Then there are the other ones that basically are the developer who had to reserve a certain amount of land for open space, and so they put some of it under easement. Those are the ones where the lines go all crazy, zigzag, it's impossible to follow the map. Those are the ones where you are going through swamps and up cliffs because they put under conservation easement the part they couldn't develop anyway. Um, Flanders probably would no longer accept an easement of that sort. Um, they're very hard to monitor because you have a whole lot of people involved, different property owners once that development is made. It's much harder to deal with. Um, in either case, we have those easements we have accepted the responsibility to monitor those easements in perpetuity. That's our responsibility and it's absolutely key. The easement goes with the land. It does not matter how many times it is sold. The easement does not change. It is there and we have accepted that responsibility even if the owners have changed. So a lot of what we do now is communicate with the owners to make sure that they understand right from the beginning what their easement is. And if you're volunteering on an easement as a monitor, we will ask you to check the GIS in the town and find out when the owner, when it changes, alert us if it changes, and then we go contact those people. We talk to them about Flanders, we talk to them about monitoring, we talk to them about their particular easement. So hopefully we have better communication from the get-go. There's a key note about signage, um, and that's that the signs on the bottom um, we used to have one on some easements that said conservation easement. We changed it to one that we'll give to some of you today that says no public access. The difference is that the first sign seemed to invite people on to the property, even though it's private property, we don't own it. As soon as we put up a sign saying conservation easement, no hunting, no whatever, it didn't say no trespassing, it just said no hunting. People, including people who have become monitors since then, thought, Oh, my, I can go on this property and walk there because it says it's a conservation easement. So we've changed to a sign that says no public access. On the easements, you have to be aware that we only put signs up either by the owner's request or if we've had a particular reason why we wanted signs there, we asked the owner and they okayed it. It's private property. We can't just go put signs up. So in that case, it, sometimes tricky to find the boundaries, especially the boundary between the part of that property that is under easement and the part of that property that is not under easement. That line can run right through somebody's backyard and we're not going to put signs there. So the easement monitors, it's best if they know how to read those maps, if they're pretty confident or willing to become confident with a compass and or walk with someone who's already monitored that easement so that they learn where those lines are because they're not going to find them on the trees the way you will around a mm -hmm. few property. Priscilla, on that sign, are we asking people to change the signs this year or is that, if there's a one if of those signs? If there's one that says, yes, we if, you, if you have an easement and it has the sign that says conservation easement, no hunting or whatever, um, we'll ask you to change that to the sign that says no public access. That may be a two-year process, but you may have to come back to us the first year and tell us, oops, I came to those signs, and then we'll equip you with the signs the next year. Some we know, some we don't. And make sure you leave the nails really long. Yes, that's true, yeah. too. Really long. Because the trees Can everybody hear that? It's a, yeah. Leave the nails long so they don't back out. I mean, you know. But they back out, and then we end up, and that's one of the reasons we'll have a pair of signs, is to replace those that 
Where do you get the signs? Oh, Priscilla? Yes. <clears throat> Where do you get the signs? Here? If it's an easement, you'd contact me. If it's a fee, you'd contact Tom and Jennifer. Oh, okay. And then we'll get them. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, I guess I keep going. Key thought here is permanently restrict. That phrase in perpetuity again. We have had one owner tell us, this document is antiquated. This is stupid. This was written back in 2010. Flanders needs to update this document. No. It was written. It's a legal document. It is in perpetuity. They can occasionally be changed, but that's a long legal process. The document, as it is written, is a document we have to deal with. Um, and that's one thing, yet yeah, that one owner was really, I think, this is antiquated. Fighters has to update this document. No, it's in perpetuity. Um, for our purposes, that document, the, the conservation restriction is what it's called, is as it was written. Reserved rights is another part of the conservation easement that we deal with. The owners often, they will have, there are things that are just plain restricted. You cannot do this, 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 this. But it may say the owner reserves the right to build a trail. And it may tell you where that trail can be, and it may not. The owner reserves the right to cut dead trees. But then it may say the owner reserves the right with written permission from Flanders to cut living trees. And those are key differences that you have to be aware of. You're not going to call it to the owner, but you need to be aware of what's allowed on that property and therefore when you need to alert us that something's going on that may be a, a legitimate use of a right versus a legitimate use of a reserved right, but oops, did they ask for permission or not? And those are the things we need to be able to monitor. Um, Good example, I had one where... Uh the easement owner wanted to put uh, trees that would provide a barrier between him and the next property uh, on the easement. And I was like, that doesn't sound like it might be kosher, right? So I, I checked, and as long as that planting was a native species, it was perfectly okay. So they could go out on the easement and plant these, because plant these, it was written there. It was written there. You know, you're allowed to replace or put in native species on that property, so and some um, that was perfectly okay. Would, yeah, and some properties it wouldn't be. Some they're, properties wouldn't be. They're all individual. There are ones, there's one property that has the reserved right to mend fences, but the reserved right only with written permission to move fences. And those are the, the little things we have to be aware of in order to be able to monitor properly. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have a question. Yeah. Um, you brought up the owners. Do, do the owners generally um, know that they have an easement? Do they know what the co uh, content of the easement is? Have they read it themselves, do you think, usually? I would say now, any new easement coming on board, yes, we know whether they have read it or not. Old easements, if it's one of those larger properties, you can be almost sure, well, the original owner knew about it, but even when they sell it, they're concerned people that convey that information to the new owners and the new owners know it. Um, other new owners may or may not. Um, we had one recently where there was an easement that was had several violations on it, um, and it was for sale. And when we contacted the realtor, which then had to take that active step, the realtor didn't know there was an easement on it and didn't know that there were any violations. So we, the new owners do know. Um, the new owners have become involved with Flanders. But it's, yeah, we cannot assume mm -hmm. that they know. Yeah. Valid point. Mm -hmm. We do alert them and supposedly they get a postcard once a year saying we're coming to monitor. And supposedly if they didn't know they had these, but they call us up and say, what are you talking about? <laughs> but that may be making too much of an assumption. <laughs> Okay, my next slide. Um, the baseline documentation report, which can also be called the current condition report, um, is very useful to us. Um, we use it now in exactly what Elaine was talking about. 
when we have a new Eastman donor, we send them a copy of this and ask to sit down and talk with them. And it gives us a stepping off point. This is what the property looked like when it was, and our monitors say it still looks like this. Do you agree this is what it looks like? Are you seeing any differences? And we use that as, a, as an opening to converse with the Eastman donors. Um, discretion brings us back to those signs on Eastman, no public access, so the emphasis on that. Um, and it also brings us to the easement owners will have, the easement monitors will have postcards. We ask you to send a postcard, call or email the owner before you go to visit. You invite them to join you if they wish to. Um, and we ask you to leave a postcard unless you met with them and you, know, you told them you were there. If you haven't met with them, we ask you to leave a postcard on their door just saying, I was here. So they know that we are doing our due diligence and that we did actually show up and monitor their property. Um, shamefully, I can't give you those postcards tonight because I did look ahead of time and we've run out and we have to have more for <laughs> So we'll get those to you. Unless there are questions, more, whatever. An observation about um, the baseline reports. So that's a requirement under the federal law that establishes the tax deductibility of these things. And it's some of the things that we include in there are ways of trying to interpret the 1986 federal law that says there will be an inventory of conservation values. That's turned into the report. It isn't the same as the legal document. It helps you interpret yeah. the legal document. So you'll always default to the recorded easement, but it can help you find particularly if they're written with this in mind, it can help you find, oh, here's those permitted uses and here's those other things. It often includes large chunks of text directly out of it, but in a way that you can digest it. And if you do end up enforcing it, the high quality photos that are part of that are gonna get blown up very large and held up in court. So it, it's, it's, a useful, it's useful the way you're using it, but there's a legal basis for it on both ends. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. What happens to the monitor report? Tom, you want to go through this one? Well, I'm about February when we get all the monitor reports in. We have to get your voice in. So we, we are recording this, by the way, just for the record. Should have, should have been obvious, but I should have said. Long about the February meeting of the land management committee, when we finally have all of the monitor reports in house, both easement and fee. Um, so and I will explain to the land management committee what issues we found and we'll discuss what action needs to be taken to follow up on observations that monitors have written up in their land monitor report. Um, if, there's, if there's an issue that seems to suggest a violation, um, either an encroachment by a neighboring property owner on a property that we own or uh, a misuse of an uh, easement property, um, we'll go out and double check to make sure that what the monitor saw is, is documented well and then we'll approach the landowner to explain what needs to be done, what we found is what we think needs to be done. Uh, throughout this process we'll keep the land monitor informed. Um, more often than not we'll want them involved in following up uh, a visit to the property to put up precisely what was seen and resulted in the note in the monitor report. And we keep that conversation going with the land monitors through to the end of the resolution. Okay. And then do you want to talk about violations committee now or is that something? Sure. Yeah. Um, violations committee is just a small group that if if something comes in that's either an encroachment on a fee property or a violation on an easement, it first goes to land management to see if we can handle it. If, if land management as a bigger group, a more relaxed group maybe, um, can make a phone call or Vince can make a phone call, can write a letter, very often everything's resolved right then and there. Oops, I'm sorry, I didn't realize I was dumping on your property. I'll move it. And it can be resolved at that level. Only if it goes on for several years and we get no response from the owner or if we get a, uh, I didn't do that, or I don't care sort of a response, then it goes up to the violations committee, at which point we often end up asking for legal consultation, or we, so far we've not 
We have not. We have We have not yet had to take anyone to court. Um, but we have to work. Sometimes it takes years to work through any of the violations. Um, our hope is that we're catching them earlier, and we'll hopefully the violations committee will not be necessary in another couple of years. We'll just meet once a year to have a cup of coffee and say, ah, do you nothing new. Uh, it's been about volunteers. They're you guys, right? So members of the community care about the land, uh, willing to take a few hours a year to come out and help us. Um, qualifications, physically able to walk off trail, not me. <laughs> <laughs> not me uh, I'm going to do mine like December 31st, I think, this year. <laughs> um, Tom, I'll look at it. Um, some basic navigation skills are helpful. We're not going to be going through compass training or GPS training in this session. Um, I think we'll offer that as a one-off, so if people are interested, we'll get together with people that are more attuned to how to do that, and maybe do you know, help with one-on-one -on -one sessions, bring people out. Um, it is really helpful as you look at some of these maps, you know, it gives you compass headings and whatnot, so compass is good. I, I use the GPS apps on my phone, they're awesome. Um, I, I don't use a compass anymore, <laughs> uh, hardly, because uh, they, they're still really good. So, um, if you need help with that, just, just reach out. Um, and we are ambassadors, right? So, you know, please wear your wear your hat, wear your name tags with with pride. Um, you know, reach out to the community as you as you're doing this, particularly with the easements and then so mentioned the relationship with the owners. Really important role that we play there. And if you know anybody that wants to be a monitor, let us know. Um, we're actually trying to double up properties. We have one monitor per property, which is fine. But as we think about safety and we think about just having backups and stuff like that, it's always good to go out with more than one person, and it's always good to have backups. So we're trying to like get get some more people involved. So if you know people, please please let us know. Okay, now we'll get into the meat of it. So land monitoring preparation, what to take with you. Uh, this is just an example, normal hiking gear. So if I go out on a, a long day hike, I, I just this is what's in my pack. I have it like sitting out there, I just grab it and go. So you probably have typical things there, um, you know, with the tick, uh, tick I have a tick remover in there, bug spray, gloves if it's cold, of course, and you, you know, you might be going through some brush and stuff, so gloves are good anyways. Um, bears are there, we all have seen them, um, make a lot of noise, for bear bells, whatever. I carry an air horn, I've never had to use it. Um, whistle, um, if you're in trouble. If it is it gets when you're alone, if you trip and fall, or whatever you're alone, remember three blasts of a whistle. We'll give you a whistle in your bag. Three blasts of a whistle uh, indicates a problem. Hopefully that'll carry you through and more people will help you. Um, I mentioned a compass and a GPS unit. The map, um, you should get familiar with the property, your property, the map of your property. Uh, as I'll show in a minute. We want, we want to cover most of the property over a three year period. So you want to kind of know where you are, and, and some of the properties are very large, so you're not going to cover the entire property in one, sh one shot. But over a three-year period, you want to cover the whole property. So get oriented with your map. Um, I think that's a good. Small trash bag is always good, you know, clean up the property while you're out there if you find something. I I'm shocked at how little trash I find, actually. I think people in Woodbury are really good about, you know, mm -hmm. you go to Whittemore. Whittemore is a very popular place, and you've been like, I don't find a lot of trash. Do you find a lot of trash, Dave? Mm -hmm. You check it. I check the parking lot every once a week, and it's uh, very yeah. minimal. Yeah, we don't put out trash cans or anything, but we still don't. So it's a testament to our community. I think it's great. Um, so now we have the special monitoring items. Um, we're giving you an ID card, which I think you got. We have a dashboard sign. So if you're parked in a non-Whittemore, non-Flanders non parking lot, make sure you have that in your dashboard. So identify yourself. Um, we're giving you a clipboard so you can attach the documents to it that you need to have. Last year's report, always good in the preparation to, to look at the last year's report. There might be something you found, you want to see if it's cleaned up, that kind of thing. Have that with you so you can reference it. Um, a blank form or just a blank um, monitor form, you can start filling it out on the way. Signage as we talked about. Um, we're not asking monitors to, to, to mark new boundaries. We have uh, Mike Carlo and others that go out there and, and mark new boundaries. 
but if you see a sign that's obviously was there, dropped off, or needs to be replaced, we're asking you to do that. Uh, hammer and nails to do that, and as Guy mentioned, when you hammer it in, leave a little nail out there so it doesn't, um, as the tree grows, it'll mess it up if you have to hammer it all the way in. And we have survey marking tape. Um, and then this, new this year, we've got that one uh, handout for the invasives, which we'll get into a little bit later. <coughs> what to wear? Um, Excuse me. Yes. I have a question on the, uh, the marking tape and the invasive species. Yes. Um, does that apply to the easements also, the marking tape? Because I know I've been talking to Priscilla about that. We use marking tape on the easements on the outer boundaries. Yeah. Um, again, the inner boundaries are often across somebody's yard or whatever, so it depends on the circumstances. Um, but we use marking tape on easements as it is necessary to be able to find out that. Yes. And then some of the easements we're going to start using just the plain little square yellow signs to mark even that interior border so we can tell where we are. And on the invasive species, um, I know I know some, <laughs> I don't know all, and there's a lot more now than uh, Yeah, in your, in your packet, we're going to give you an invasive species booklet for, okay. for plants, just plants, right? I think it's just plants. Plants. Um, that'll give you some orientation, and over time you'll get to know the, oh, there, are, there are tons of them, right? So you'll get to know that. So we're not expecting you to, like, Take invasives out, but it, it's a good note to make that something's been totally the hillside's been taken over by barberry. It wasn't that way two or three years ago. It's something we might want to right? Yes, Scott. But as far as equipment to take, um, I wear chaps. Okay. Uh, they're logging, logger chaps. They're bright orange, which is good, and they're bulletproof. And when you're walking through barberry on 105 acres, you know it gets really they really work. You can blast through it pretty yeah. well. Yeah, I've so, ripped pants like this up. Mm -hmm. yeah, multiple rows and barbarian are really awful to walk through. Did everybody catch that? To where the yeah, chaps are? Yeah. Uh, where did we get them? Anybody who sells chainsaws. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 My son is a logger type, so probably from Yeah, him. great suggestion. And you have this coming up. Yeah. But the other item that's absolutely critical is on your phone, and it's your camera. Yes. And, Go ahead. and a piece of advice that I've learned recently that's very helpful. Um, sometimes, for privacy reasons, we turn off the locational abilities of our phones. And if you disable that with your camera, then nobody is going to be able to pinpoint on the GIS map the pictures you took of the violation. So if you're going to use your phone to require that, enable location both on the phone and on the camera within the phone. That'll, that'll save a lot of headache figuring out really where you were. Great suggestion. I didn't know that. Was great. Um, yeah, survey market tape, get back to that. Um, two things. I think more conservative on easements, probably more liberal on our own properties. Just if we have a long line, we want to know what it is, but maybe on even we want to tone it back a little bit because it's, it's a, you know, it gets in the owner's visual uh, way. Um, the other thing is just a, as a convention, we gave you orange and blue tape in your in your bags, and I, I looked it up when I first started monitoring this stuff. And there's, I, I guess there is no convention. Tim, maybe you can correct me, but there's not like 100% convention True. about what color goes where. Mm -hmm. But the convention I was kind of taught, and Jeff, maybe you can correct me is that the orange is like a line and a corner would be blue and orange maybe? Is that is that kind of how we've Doesn't now? Bell, okay. Remind me the blue tape. That's blue. usually the wetlands. Wetlands, wetlands yes. Yes. Oh, yes. yes. Okay. Good. Good correction. Orange for boundaries and blue for, for wetland delineation is a standard surveying method. Okay. Great. I that one's not great. Thanks. So we'll capture that in the next training. So blue for more wetlands areas, and, and so either whether it's a corner or a straightaway, the orange goes. All right, uh, what to wear? Again, hunting season. I looked it up. I think these dates are right, but don't, you know, I found out there's, you know, I'm not a hunter, so maybe some of you guys are hunter can correct me, but there's deer hunting with bow, deer hunting with shotgun, deer, you know, all different seasons. Bottom line is, assume 
there's hunting going on out there when you're so so please wear the vests, wear something bright. This is kind of what, what, what how I go out. I think Guy's suggestion on the on the chaps is a great one. Um, wear your identification. Um, I think that's pretty self-explanatory there. And mostly we're monitoring in the winter season anyway, so the colder season, so dress appropriately. Um, other preps, uh, know the property background, I think we talked about that, know, know what the documents say, look at last year's report. Um, I mentioned walking the, uh, the areas around, so this is just an example of trying to monitor. This is one property I had, so 2017, 18, 19, I kind of, over those three years, I kind of hit different areas, and this was my trace off my GPS. Um, so try to hit, try to hit everything between in, over a three-year period, but you don't don't feel like you have to hit everything every year. The only other advice I would offer on that is, if it's an easement you're monitoring, you've got two kinds of places that you are going to find violations more often than not. One is a boundary encroachment by a neighbor, so it's really good to do the perimeter every year if you can. The second is if there's a place where there are retained rights and it's not always clear where the line is through there. And, and those are places to go back to every year. And then other parts of the property, I think your three-year rotation is great because they're least likely to have those kinds of things happening. And nobody drives into the middle of a property with no road to dump garbage. Um, so again, the perimeter and places that are going to have enabled activities um, maybe need a little more frequency. Are you just talking about the, when you say entire property, just the perimeter of the entire property? Yeah, I was getting more at the interior. Oh, so if you think okay. about Whittemore, if you're the monitor for Whittemore, it'd take you a week to get the whole thing done, right? So it's not the expectation that you get the whole interior. And you and I should coordinate on that because I have to do that too because I have the easement there. <laughs> yeah. Um, what else? Uh, we talked about contacting the owner and scheduling the visit. Um, I say best time to this fall during leaf out, but not required. There's some argument to maybe an opinion on this is that uh, monitor at different times of year, in addition to the different places or over the three year rotation, monitor in spring, so you see different fl fl flora or fauna or whatever. Um, we, we pretty much, our season in Flanders has always been sort of the October, November, December, I think most people end up monitoring that period because of leaf out, but... And because of snow. Um, yeah. in, a, in a winter that's cold, you won't see what's under the snow. And so, um, leaf out, but not January, has tended to allow folk um, to see more. And it's generally recommended to do it in the same season, but there's no reason why um, it has to be one season or another, except for convenience. And again, if there's heavy snow, you're not going to see what somebody does. Right. One other silly little comment that sort of fits in with part of this is back to those reserved rights and reading them before you go. We have one very large easement that says no hunting, but it has a reserved right to allow Mr. X to hunt. If you hadn't read that reserved right to let Mr. X hunt, you wouldn't know that you needed to call that owner before you went and say, please tell Mr. X not to hunt on September 14th because of, I don't know, be hunting season, but don't hunt that day because I'm coming through. So you have to know those reserved rights in order to know whether you need to be alert or something. Okay, thanks. Uh, so the actual walk itself, um, just some tips. Enjoy it. Obviously, you're out there. Just enjoy it. Um, check with the owner. The third time I mentioned that. Uh, park in a good place. Put the dashboard sign on indicating uh, who you are. Buddy system, great idea. Uh, it's always good to go out with somebody else anyways, but you know, particularly for safety, always let loved ones know your plan. Bring a charged cell phone. I mentioned the hunting season, bright clothing. Um, know how to deal with bear encounters. Or maybe even mountain lions, who knows? Um, general safety communication about drop offs and overhanging trees. So, again, just it's, it's safety first. And that's why we're trying to encourage the buddy system to go out with another person. Glad to see couples here. Have a pretty good sense what the weather report is for the next eight hours. Um, this is particularly important in the summer when thunderstorms and heat are an issue. But 
Um, you can have a day that looks like a wonderful monitoring day that goes very pear-shaped and, and quite hostile. Um, so, plan accordingly. What to look for? Because this long, this could be a really long list, but this is some of the things that we would expect, you know, to mention in the monitoring report. You know, evidence of encroachment, obviously, from adjacent properties, Christmas trees, brush, people throwing it in there. Obviously, that's the most, one of the most common ones. Uh, easements within, might be, the owner might be encroaching on the easement. That's another one. I mentioned yard waste, plantings that aren't supposed to be planted there. Uh, deer stands, found a bunch of those over, over the years. Um, invasives taking over, again, we don't expect, this is not something on a fee property, we know invasives happen, but if you're just seeing it like going crazy, let us know and make a note of it. Um, party, camping spots, fire rings, um, people making trails out there. Uh, any other niche and, uh, um, natural observations, I just throw one up here. Um, this was a wetland on one of the properties I, I do. Um, and. Uh, well, yeah, I noticed the water kept going down every year, and I don't know, it's, it's seasonal anyways. But, you know, this was it one year, then the next year, hit a snapping turtle in the middle of just from, trying to find the last little bit of water in, the, in this thing. Um, and then now, you know, this is over a three year period, now it's, it, it's converted, it's just it's dried up and now it's all grassland. Right? So, that's a really fast transition, I would say, I'm no naturalist, but that's a pretty fast transition. Where are the nearest right? wells? What's that? Where are the nearest wells? I don't know. I will be, yeah, if you've had some development near there and some people have sunk individual wells, that'll dry out something. Okay, like that. yeah. And I would, that's a good question. Would that be somebody drills a well over there on the next property over? That's, is, that's not encroaching. They're just it's, sucking it, the water no, from the it's, it's a pain, right? Yeah. It's an impact. But water rights, mineral rights, the right to go under other people's properties were not really well taken care of at all. Yeah. So. Anybody see anything else that I didn't mention that they've seen over the years that. <clears throat> Examples of encroachment or uh, stuff. TV antennas. TV antennas. <laughs> yeah. um, we also had on a property a big old well from down <coughs> so I marked it for safety reasons and we we yeah. okay. A house that got bigger? Mm -hmm. Right? A house that got bigger. Yeah, like yeah. the next person bought the house and made it bigger and even said it couldn't be. Sometimes it's really huge. It's not as simple as, as yeah. um, there's a trash pile. Hard to like somebody yeah. somebody <laughs> built a garage they weren't entitled to. And, and you caught it 11 months later. Or if you're not being a conscientious monitor, yeah, we longer have. than that. It can be things like that. It can, it, can be, um, it can be the neighbor who violated the easement. Technically, the landowner has a violation on their property. It's the neighbor that did it. It's the neighbor who chopped down the trees. It's the neighbor who did the encroachment. Yeah. Well, we had a, a, a adjoining property. He didn't know where his property line was, and he built his barn on Flanders property. Mm -hmm. And he moved it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So mm -hmm. it can be a big thing. <laughs> you never know. Uh, take pictures, right? So record when the picture taken is if you have the app set up correctly, you can get your picture. Uh, Register with the GPS coordinate. Um, the description of the picture, the direction from which it was taken, you know, make a note on the map, on your report, when you're writing it up, would be really helpful. Uh, for properties with trails, Dave Terry and his team do a great job every week. Uh, he counts on people letting them know, right? So if there's a tree down, if you're on one of those properties, please let them know. Uh, and then walk with the owner, it's all about relationship building on the easements as well. As a rule, we baseline documentation reports, they have photographs that go with them that are marked in certain locations. And don't knock yourself out with 150 photographs for a 12 acre property. Photograph places you want to go back to every year and take pictures there. And then take pictures of significant things that have changed. Nobody needs 100 photographs of a boundary. But what you just exhibited here was a feature that was worth monitoring every year that you knew you would go back to and you can track the change. Um, again, it's always a good point to look for these uh, pins. Some of them are harder to find. Um, and we try to mark them again and again and again, as you can see. Some of the markings here have a pin in a corner. Um, some of them are buried in swamps and stuff. Again, if you can't find it, you're in trouble, let us know. People like Mike Carl and others, we can get out there and try to help you with that. 
Some are really hard to find. I, I particularly like these ones that are just like little drill holes in a wall. I mean, they're just hard, indetectable, really, in a lot of cases. But we try to mark them up the best we can. Um, you know, again, while you're out there, if you're having trouble finding the border, just let us know. And if you're good at it, we'd love to have you on the team. <laughs> if you know how to navigate these things, because there's some areas that are just really tough to, to, to navigate, um, even with a GPS. And make the marks, uh, make, make some notations on your maps, you know. Oops. You can see a notation. I, I could never find this drill hole supposedly there. Um, so again, it's a follow-up. Um, while you're on the walk again, take your take notes, uh, look for invasives, check for your ticks on the way out. I learned this the hard way. Um, save a GPS track if you're using GPS. Again, if you need to, if you like to know how to use an app for GPS, let us know. Happy to walk you through that. Um, I find a couple apps helpful just me just learning a lot is these couple pic I naturalist and picture this are a couple apps that I, you know, if I see a plant, I don't know what it is, I take a picture and it tells me what the plant is and that kind of thing. So these are just handy things that I've come across as I've kind of done this work. Uh, trail markings, again, if there uh, if there's inadequate trail markings, let Dave know. Here's some you know, left turn, right turn, straight, you know, the blazing that we're supposed to have. Um, I think we mentioned about boundary marking and the nails in the tree. Uh, seven foot or higher is recommended. Um, you know, again, more Probably more on fee, less on easement, and with you know proper supervision about where you put on easement, so you don't bury the owner and all sorts of markings on the property. As far as follow up, uh, I don't know, Tom, you're going to take us through this, but we, you know we have a standard form that well, we have an easement form and a, and a fee form. Um, you know, uh, good idea to fill it out as soon as possible after you get off the property, right? You're going to forget stuff. Your notes are going to get all scrambled. So good idea to do it pretty quickly after you get off the property. Um, and there's, I think most of these things, most of these bullets are, are parts of the form, right? So I right. right. try to make it as user friendly as possible with the form, just fill in the blanks in a lot of cases. But you, you know, expound upon it. Just don't do yes or no. If you can, just, if there's things that will be helpful, please make a note of it. And what, what's your protocol if the landowner's with you and asks for interpretation of a reserve right. Is this allowed? Is that allowed? Are you going to hit that? I'll hit that. Good. <laughs> say, say that again. So it's a... We'll hit it. Um, yes. it, it okay. Basically, it's um, your comment is, I'm taking notes, I'll ask. Good. And do you know who to return who to ask which board committee deals with that? You, they come back first to the, if it's an easement, the easement monitor Good. coordinator, and then that would take it to the land management committee and then we decide. Because that, that's ideal, right? They're asking before they've done it. Right. But you, but you That's know ideal, but, but right. you have to be careful not to, not to answer. Don't interpret for it. No. Yes. This gets into some of this part, which is just the facts. You're not there to make judgments. Just report what you've seen. We'll pick, take care of it. You know, a lot of pictures. Um, um, notifying Tom, Jennifer, Priscilla about any, any things you see. You know, give them a call. Say, oh, I got the report coming, but I saw this. Maybe we can start the process of going back out there and looking at it. And the reports are confidential. So we have the comment that an easement, the owner can always ask to see it. And that's another reason why you have to be careful about what you said. Which leads us to this piece. Oh, yeah, that leads us here. OK, so it's just a, a list of what seem like silly words that you should avoid using in your report, because you are not making the judgment. You are documenting what you saw. Um, instead, to use things like possible area of concern, area to be evaluated, to be really careful. It seems foolish, but sometimes when, when even when, if you come back out and you relook at it, you think, well, you know, I'm not sure that really was a violation. Or you ask somebody else to look at it and go through the conservation restriction with, ah, suddenly there's some question. Was that a violation? Wasn't it a violation? If you've put it in print, it leaves us with a difficulty of addressing something that maybe we don't have to address unless we, until we sort it all out and know what we're talking about. Um, that also comes through that if the owner asks to see it, and we have written clearly there, or you've said to the owner, this is a violation, then our communication, Flanders' communication with the owner, 
starts with SISTSA, starts with people saying, what do you mean this is a violation? Where if you have it listed as a, an area we need to investigate, our conversation starts on a much gentler, friendlier basis, and we're much more apt to communicate that. So that becomes important. Um, same comments on reserved rights. You don't say, this was obviously an okay reserved, or they did this and it wasn't even a reserved right, it's okay. Those are not comments that go in the report. You document what you see, you don't make a judgment about it. Um, and that gets us back to communication with the communication that you people, the people that you meet. And at that point, I'm going to turn it over to Deb and Mike and ask them to talk about a person they met while they were monitoring one time. Okay, uh, we monitor an easement called the uh, Cox easement. Louder, louder. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, if you can't hear me, I've been retired. I don't talk loud anymore. I don't get to talk. Even. Um, so one year, the first year that we went, we went with the former monitor and Priscilla, and we found a tree stand, a hunter's tree stand. Um, that was taken down. I guess some. The owner was contacted via our report. Um, and then um, we usually go uh, first, second week in November. Now I know Tom had the uh, hunting dates on there. And we never ran into, we went the first or second week in September, we never ran into somebody. But one year we couldn't do that. We went just around before Thanksgiving, around the 20th. And we were walk, monitoring signs and walking the edge, and all of a sudden, someone with a, in hunting gear, a hunting rifle and stuff, approached us and said, hey, what are you doing? And we told them. We were monitoring the property for Flanders, and he said, don't you know this is private property? So I said, well, this property is an easement for Flanders, and..." You're not supposed to be here. And they, I'll say this first. The gentleman was very nice. He's been hunting the property since he's 12 years old. So he knew where he wanted to be. And he uh, showed us a letter that he had from the uh, landowner, which a hunter has to get to be on someone else's private property. And he had that for that year. And he, uh, I mentioned the signs, and he said he's very confused about the signs. Well, one thing that happened, he parked back uh, on the property, and where he came into Flanders, there were no signs. But he would, on his, his where he hunts from, he would see the Flanders fee signs. So he knew he couldn't be there because He's looking at fee and easements on this side. It, it's a classic, um, the internal line of an easement between not being marked between that piece of the property that is under easement and not. So it wasn't marked, but he had no right. way of knowing what that was. So we had a nice discussion, and he just asked me if another piece of property that was right adjacent to this, which also was owned by the person who owned Cox, and I said, not to my knowledge, but if you go over there, just look for signs. And, you know, he thanked us and he, he went on his way. So it was very cordial and, and so on. And um, I think that someone, it went in my report, it went to Priscilla, I reported it to Priscilla verbally. And uh, someone must have, may have said something to him or the owner. Not to him. To the owner, oh, I'm sorry. But now things have changed. There's a new landowner who now works for, for Flanders uh, as a volunteer. So I don't think we should have that kind of a problem anymore. But I guess you could run into it. And just like this, like I said, the fella was doing this since he's 12 years old. And he just easily knew the people. So Yeah, he didn't realize he was violating. He he, right. he volunteered to show us the letter. Yeah, he showed us and it had, he had exactly what 
he thought he was supposed to have to give him right. permission. And so. he did have what he was supposed to have. Yes. And right. I think that the key thing you folks did was you found out the facts. You found out that he had permission. We then knew that our difference of opinion was with the owner of the property who had given him permission, mm -hmm. not with the hunter himself. Right. Um, and that's the key piece of information that we needed to have. So that's thank okay. You. Thanks, Mr. Sure. I think a lot of this is kind of repetitive. Uh, I don't know if you yes, see this is anything I'm going to here. Or... Do, there was one other thing on, on, on the communications. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the only other key thing on that is back to the same thing. If somebody asks you if you can do something, do not say yes, do not say no. Um, just, just let us know because we often have to seek legal advice before we can even answer that question. I think we covered most of this. Um, again, we're ambassadors. Um, you know, we're not there to interpret. Uh, again, a lot of this is in your in your documentation there. So, um, just some resources if you need help. So, kind of winding up here. Um, each property has a file with uh, all the historical documentation and the management plans and things like that. Um, these are also available on Google Drive, so you can give, give you access electronically as well. Uh, key people on the committee to go to if you have any questions. Again, we talked about some of these folks. Uh, kiosk, Ingrid is not here. She deals with the um, kiosk, violations, Priscilla, Compass Help. You know, we've got some people saying they can help out with Compass, which is great. Uh, GPS, uh, I can help out with that as well. Um, again, um, there's people willing to, to reach out and work with you if you have questions. So our special concern this year, so we're trying to do something something different. Um, hemlocks, I think we all know hemlocks and love them. They're all over the place in this area. If you don't, that's a picture of one from a distance. Here's a picture of one up close. Um, there's this thing called woolly adelgid that has been attacking the wool. Um, uh, it's from Asia. It's a, like many invasive insects, um, and it's been attacking uh, for many, many years. Uh, you can see there's a lot of research done here. There's a woman named by the name of Carol Che at the UConn. She's an entomologist at, 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 in the state of Connecticut. She's been out here. She went to Nanawak Falls last year. Jeff Sherman is heavily involved in that, if you know Jeff. Um, and they've been working with the town of Woodbury to actually put a species of beetle that will attack uh, as a natural predator to this, this woolly adelgid. And it's pretty successful in a lot of areas of the country. So we're trying to do that here in this area. Southbury Platte Farm did it recently, and I know a lot of other towns are starting to do it. So what we'd like to do is document um, where we're seeing this will be adelgid in a big way on our properties. So not to like do a full survey, but just as you're, as you're doing your regular monitoring, when you come across the hemlocks, take a look, right? And it's not that hard to see. You should, even on the lower branches, you just turn it over and you should see this white uh, substance on there. And that's, that's indicative of the, of the infestation. And this would be considered a major infestation. So. If you see that, and it will kill the tree in three or four years. I mean, it's, Ooh, it's, pretty, it's pretty nasty um, stuff. You also uh, see, yes, Mike? You also see sometimes yellow needles. So you can right. spot the yellow needles and then turn it over. Yeah, the yellow needles or the lack of new needles. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there's, there's like a dark green and a lime green or a lighter color green, which indicates the hemlock is growing out and, and mm -hmm. healthy. If you see a hemlock in the spring or even the summer that has no, like, Light colored needles, you pretty much guarantee that they're either very drought stricken or they are having this problem. So, again, I guess the, the idea is that we would get a, some documentation here and where we find have the infestation, and we can take it to part of the land management committee and decide do we buy beetles? You know, beetles are very expensive. So for 100 of them, it's two, $200. Um, okay. So, it's, it's an expensive exercise, but where we see where it's devastating, um, like Nanawak Falls, Nanawak Falls, a lot of stalls, hemlocks, you've been up there. It, it would be terrible, right? So, where we see that in our properties, we want to address it. Where so. do we, because we have the entire property line between us and our neighbors, our hemlocks. Yeah. And we've been trying, somebody's been trying to spray them, but I mean, if they go, it's like, 
If you want information, I mean, I, I bought deals for my property last say, year. Where, where I spent 200 bucks and bought a can canister and put them out there, and I'm hoping it works because I've got hemlocks near me. Um, I can send a link to folks to where you can do it. It's called, yeah. tree, it's called Tree Savers. You can look it up. It's, it's Tree Savers in Pennsylvania. And you buy them, and they show you, they give you a video on how to deploy them and stuff. Really? It's cool. Okay. They look like a ladybug. Yeah, they're very, very small. I mean, oh, you, they're, they're, they're so really small. Not like a lady. I mean, they're, they're very, very small. Are they? They're not ladybugs. No. I mean, they're the head of a pin type of thing. They're very small. Like poppy seeds, yeah. Uh, but you get them in a canister, and they, they send them, like, you know, in a conditioned box and whatever, and you deploy them within 24 hours. And, um, again, set, Flat Farm in Southbury's done it. Uh, I've done it on my property. Tom, Jennifer, you've done it on yours, right? Yeah. Um, Nanawa Falls. So there's a lot, lot going on in this. So this is an area of concern. So maybe next spring we can pool our resources and maybe get a fund drive together and, and buy some deals. And then also be, that, that's for fee properties. We, of course, can't go out to an easement property and mm -hmm. release beetles and treat. <laughs> but if we monitor, and again, as John said, it's not a matter of asking you to go mark every hemlock and look at it. But if you see hemlocks and you see the disease process there, then we can use that as another way to reach out and create that bond with Eastman owners by writing them a letter and say, hey, our monitor noticed this, this is what you can do about it. And that, that is useful not only to the hemlocks, but also to our relationship with the monitor. With the if you look at that map, it's a largely contiguous area of infestation with a couple outliers. They have spread from south to north, and a cold winter really knocks them back. So until the climate's too warm to give us that benefit, we get four degrees below zero. It kills most of them for that year. There is another unfortunate synergy between the hemlock woolly adelgid and another pest called the hemlock looper. And so sometimes the adelgids and the, and the looper interact with each other and keep each other at a moderate level, but if there's too much of one or, or not enough of the other, the tree goes faster. And we have had this pest here for since the early 90s. It's, but it's been getting more mortality the longer it's been around. In the Berkshires, I first saw it in 1997, and hemlock mortality has been pretty low. But it's colder there. And that's one of the reasons. Yeah, well, the warming climate is that's, it, It's going to be a bigger and bigger issue. OK, so look out for that. Note it in your reports. Uh, and the last one, just throw it out there, oh, uh, because this is Something that caught my attention recently. It's in Southbury. Yeah. It's in Southbury? Yep. This guy? You don't want that guy. No. Yeah, no. so this is, I mean, I'm no expert, but uh, it was pretty scary the article I read about this guy. I've seen uh, those in Philly. They're horrifying. Um, really? That is a, a, a killer of fruit trees and of crops and grapes, like so vineyards. Yeah. Are, and when you first see one, you say, oh, that's a very pretty insect. Smash mm -hmm. every single one you see and hope you've killed them before they spread. So this is a PSA, public service announcement kind of thing. So they go to fruit trees? They go to fruit trees. Mm -hmm. They, they also vines. destroy many other crops. But fruit trees and grapevines are particularly vulnerable. Um, they're in Southbury. They're in a couple other places in Fairfield County. They're bad from northern New Jersey south. They get on the bottom of your car. They travel that far. Yeah, they're awful. Can I be smart? Should we do our part? Next year we'll put the water in the bag. Okay, just some, just some final tips. Um, let's see. Boundaries are where the action is. I think, Tim, you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. you know, good idea to walk the entire border. Um, this is what I had to keep out. Keep an eye out for new building. New, like, if, if a new prop, property exchanges hands next door, ah, keep your eye out. There's going to be some problems potentially, construction and things like that. Don't rush the visit. Enjoy exploring. Um, these off-trail experiences can be magical, so appreciate the nature as you're out there. And with that, any questions or other inputs? Any other observations that we didn't cover or things we kept? Who do you go to to get some new maps? Because the ones I have are Ooh. pretty worn, and I've got people coming on now that are going to be taken over. In our office, we should have like an original. Eastman or Fee? Easement or fee? Fee. Either one. Easements? I, I have... No, no, it's fee, uh, fee property. Tom, help us out. Let me know. I'll, I'll, get, I'll get maps. Oh, okay. Yeah. You, you should have the best accurate. Think about maps that I found. I have my own map. I've been making notes on it all along. And I noticed there's notes from other people that were, you know, 
you kind of got to, the one in the office doesn't match anymore my map, so you got to, if you get a new map, make sure the notes are matched up and stuff. Yeah. It's just a little exercise you have to do. How far uh, on a fee property, and, and even on easement where there are signs, how far apart <coughs> are these signs to be placed? <coughs> we said 100 feet in there, but I don't know. Okay. Um, well, I'll tell you why I asked that, yeah. because when I first went around with the former <coughs> monitor, she kind of zipped through like we're doing that now. But you'd say, okay, it's this line, and even now if I take a compass reading, I look for that sign. You know, as a, as sometimes they're further apart. So sometimes 132 years of experience in here, somebody has a better answer than me, but I, I always try to think about if it's an area where it's going to be more encroachment, I put more signs. If it's, oh, okay. if it's kind of way out in the woods somewhere, if I don't need for as much signage, but that's just one thought. But any other thoughts? Yeah, we, I was out with Mike uh, last Monday we were doing one of the properties, and basically he said uh, roughly about 200 feet of this. If it's a nice straight line and you can see it, uh, if it's one with a lot of turns and stuff like that, we were bringing it down to somewhere around 75 to 100 feet. <coughs> if you want that no public access to be what people see along the perimeter, 50 feet. Same as you do if you're posting that. But is that along a roadway? I mean, we yeah. got a lot of these yeah, that are that the yeah, out in the woods. Right. Yeah, yeah, so a lot of roads. The woods is a different question. It's about encroachment, and it's about what people's expectations are, as well as helping you navigate. Mm -hmm. so. But the monitor doesn't really place the signs. The monitor Good repairs repairs the signs. The setup, or lets us know there's not enough signage. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. yeah. Good point. I had a couple of thoughts to throw in at the end. Ahead, that's okay for you guys. And thank you for letting me just sort of pitch ideas from the side, but I think that's maybe why I'm here. Um, yes, it is. <laughs> good. Did, did you introduce what your Yeah, right. Is? My name is Tim Abbott. I work for the Housatonic Valley Association. I've been there an awfully long time. I'm the regional land conservation director. Um, the Litchfield Hills Greenprint that Flanders is part of is something I led for many years, and now my colleague Connie Manis does and, and reports to me. Um, so, um, I was asked to sort of add um, a little more perspective. First of all, I think you have a great monitoring program. I mean, and, and it's inspiring to see um, how you do it with informed and dedicated volunteers, and you gather good information, you know what the boundaries are. I mean, I have very little to add to that. Um, if you have easements that the reserve rights are agricultural, then you're going to get people growing hemp. And you should know those laws, because they have changed a lot. <laughs> and people can be a little testy about it. Um, several years ago, if you found marijuana growing on a piece of property, there was no legitimate reason for it to be there. Uh, it is now a, a regulated agricultural property. You're never going to get a landowner to show you their permit or anything like that. <laughs> Um, but it's something you will notice because the things are very tall. This happened on an HVA property last year. On an agricultural property, which suddenly had a six foot fence on it. And, and lights. <laughs> and a lot of things. Um, and, and some very tall cannabis. And, and in fact, I'm not 100% sure whether it was... Um, high in THC and for recreational and medicinal use or whether they're growing it for fiber. I don't know. I just know that's different. Um, it came down to this easement required an agricultural management plan that no one has ever asked them to produce. And we, we, were, we fell down on the job with that one. And now they need one that's going to say whether or not they can grow this or not. Um, and that's, that's awkward, right? It's one of those things that you might have thought yeah, you know, there's not really anything happening here, and previous colleagues at HVA didn't follow up on that. And now we really wish there were an agricultural management plan, <laughs> so that it could have anticipated a legitimate crop versus a questionable crop. Sometimes you also get easements, the older ones, that have very specific purposes that are impossible to defend, like the purpose is a particular rare plant nobody has seen in 15 years. We've got one of those. It's Senehiba carpa. Senehiba carpa grows six feet tall. Um, it can go dormant for 80 years. 
-hmm. It likes disturbance. Mm -hmm. There was no plan when that thing was identified as a conservation purpose for us as the easement holder to do anything to keep it going, but it was stated along with a relatively natural area for plants and animals and wildlife, and the scenic and rural character of X town, that that was a reason this thing exists. Um, good easement drafting now is not that specific. Because we know in 100 years we're going to see a different assemblage of plants and animals and we don't want the easement's purpose to no longer exist and the easement no longer to be enforceable. But if you're stuck with something like that, and we are, um, it does help to um, check the rare species records, to get to know the two people at Deep who know these things and tell them you have a right to know them and see if they confirm the last time that thing was observed there. You can always check the uh, natural diversity database circles and buffers that they reprint without any real um, definition for why every six months. On your fee properties, you guys might have been the ones who sent them those reports. You might have been the ones who um, identified the usually rare plant that is now part of their database. But on the easement ones, it's helpful to know those circles are proximate, but if it's intersecting your property, almost anything that's rare is likely to move. So um, it's good to check that stuff. You can check it online. You can check it at the Green Prince website if you want, at least to see whether you're, the place you're going intersects with a place like that. Um, and just, again, if your easement is that specific, then you might have to know what Santa Eva Garbo looks like or whatever it is. Um, it's always the successor landowner that you immediately have interpretation issues with. What I've heard as a, a rumor anyway is because of the great influx of new people into our area, COVID related, mm -hmm. um, they're going to be, we should anticipate more interactions with people who do not understand the boundary lines of our fee properties yep. or do not understand the meaning of their easements because of the amount of new owners. Those requests for interpretation, you'll be lucky if you get them before they buy the property. But sometimes they do. Sometimes the realtor has discovered this or sometimes the seller has revealed it and the due diligence has been done. And then Flanders will probably get a phone call, probably from a realtor saying, um, I have a prospective buyer and they want to know about X or Y or Z. The planters can handle that. If you don't get that and you have a new landowner, you know, you're there for two reasons, really. You're there because you have um, an obligation, not just to monitor in, in perpetuity, but for compliance. Right? There's a legal compliance reason you're there, and there's an outreach reason you're there. And, and both are important. One is, um, one is something you must do. The other is something that's great to do. Um, and so, if you start, if you're the first point of contact for Flanders with a new landowner, you've got an opportunity to open up a new relationship and you already have guidelines about what you're not going to say. But you have lots of things you can say about why you work for Flanders and why you think it's great and, and how wonderful it is that they move to the neighborhood and yeah, Conservation easements are complicated. Did your attorney talk to you about that? Guess what? These guys know all about it. You should talk to so-and-so. You can that's the best service you can possibly do, because I guarantee you they're gonna to want to build this swimming pool where they can. <laughs> I can absolutely guarantee you they'll say this this is the most obscure, poorly written, and you can say these guys have been doing easements for a long time, talk to them. And then they at Flanders can say you know, the state of the art of the legal profession has advanced a lot since 1986 when they first had tax deductions at the federal level for conservation easements, and yeah, we're drafting them differently now. But this is the legal language we have, and this is what we have to defend, and that's where people will default. Every now and again, you'll sit there and you'll say, Jesus, if we could just, you know, if we, if we could just clarify. But as was said before, amendment is... Not a, it's not an available option in the, hand, in the handbook of what you can do with an easement. It's a last resort when you can't fix it any other way, and your basic answer is usually no. Having said that, I've been involved in a couple of easement amendments, and there are, there are issues about whether there is an improper benefit 
being derived by the person asking for that amendment. So just for a little deep background, if somebody donated you a piece of land and they gave up a bunch of rights, in theory, they give up something of value they may have gotten it a tax deduction for. And it was for a public benefit reason. Or if they sold it, they sold it for a specific value that was documented by an appraisal that said, you know, it's worth this, we can pay you this. You give that back, or some version of that back, even if it's a boundary line adjustment. Even if it's, okay, we don't really, you know, another, another trail's fine. That's an impermissible benefit. That risks... Flanders 501c3 status. As a charity, you can't. Which is why you never say, oh yeah, that's fine, you can do that. Right. You can put in that butterfly garden. You can... nope. So you might say, yeah, reasonable people would say that this thing that says no temporary or permanent structure shouldn't prevent your kids from putting up a tent. But guess what? If you bring that to the violations committee, and the violations committee says, this thing was really strong. No temporary or permanent structures means nothing. Didn't define structures. We have to define structures. Guess what? Your kid's tent can't go. Sometimes people will really hate that. I had an easement that I <laughs> monitored when I worked for the Nature Conservancy 20 years ago that had that language. It was put there by the original grantor of the easement to curtail their own impulses to make, like, duck viewing blinds and stuff. And they said, well, if we just give that up, then we won't do that stuff. Nature Conservancy said, great, because we're getting a fen. <laughs> didn't think so much about, you know, do you care if, if it's a tent? Well, no, but unfortunately, there was a reason for that being legally put there. And um, it's, the, it's, the, it's the fun of perpetuity. You guys get the fun of um, being on a piece of land as both um, the eyes of the entity that you are representing, but also, frankly, as, as folks who can help solve problems by identifying that there might be a problem and passing it on. The fact that you guys haven't gone to court yet is probably due to the fact that you're good monitors and you see problems early. But at the end of the day, you have to be willing to if you can't do anything else, and, and that's the least fun part of it. Like, none of us get involved in... in protecting nature because we like compliance, right? <laughs> but but that's that's the tool. Um, the only other advice I have, it's about pictures. Um, yes, I think being liberal with your photographs is a fine thing to do. Do not take unnecessary photographs. Don't hand in 200 photographs that are hard to see that don't really tell you much. It's fine. But as a staff person who deals with that, I would much prefer predictable photographs at predictable places that I can compare year over year, and when I think there's an issue, lots of them, <laughs> right? So maybe Flanders has a different protocol, but my advice is pick a happy medium so that you're not spending all day photographing the next 10 feet of a stone wall. But you have enough so that you can reliably say, I've assessed the condition of this property. I've got a sense of how it compares year to year. Here's some places I know I need to go back to every year because, I don't know, it was a farm dump that was on the property beforehand and it's not supposed to get bigger, so let's make sure it doesn't get bigger or whatever it was. Um, and then all the other guidance you've had on photographs I think is right on. Which way were you looking? <laughs> Can you pinpoint it on a map? If you've recorded the coordinates, that's even better. Um, and there are things you record that are essential to know, particularly with easements, and there are things that are nice to know. On a property that's held in fee that you're managing, where you actually have the ability to go and address invasives, I think I would spend even more time talking about what's going on with the Delgert or what's going on with the uh, Emerald Dashboard or what's going on with whatever. Um, some easements give the easement holder an affirmative right of management. Nature Conservancy loved that 20 years ago. Landowner doesn't have to manage the invasive species, but we have the right to if they don't. Um, probably Flanders doesn't. But if Flanders does have an affirmative right to manage on private property, then yeah, you need the same information. But it falls into those same things. The things that are nice to record, and good to share, that's about your outreach. 
things that are necessary, that's about compliance. That's my thoughts. Thanks. Thank All right, so uh, any other final questions? Um, I know it's been a long evening. I think you've earned uh, two things. Cookies. One is cookies and brownies, because not only anybody took any, or I didn't see any. So please take cookies and brownies when we're out. And your goodie bags. So in your bag, there's some, some things that will be unhelpful, like tape, like a uh, tick remover, like a uh, whistle, uh, some of the, the signage and the invasive book, and what I forget, other stuff. Um, and a bag. It's a really nice Flanders bag. It's, uh, and you'll get your vests. And you get your, so vests, uh, if, you put your, if you put your size down, uh, we'll order those and we'll let you know when they're in. Um, if you haven't tried it on and picked a size, please do so. Remember, you probably be wearing heavy clothes over it, so size up. Probably smart. Any final questions? When uh, monitors change, you pass the bag along, that would be the idea. Um, what about supplies that are consumable? So we'll give we'll give new monitors, new stuff, I guess. But if if you do have a folder that has the maps and stuff like that relative to your property, yes, please move that on so that we don't have to make another copy of the deed or the conservation restriction. So again, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for volunteering, and have a great night.